whether I'm teaching my class or a deputy's wife or chasing my twin toddlers around the house. I'm a micro preemie and a NICU mama. I'm Katie Handy, and I'm a miraculous mama. Hey everyone, welcome back to Miraculous Mamas. I am your host, Elizabeth Joy. For those of you just tuning in, Miraculous Mamas is a podcast that believes in empowering women through storytelling and education. We're super passionate about learning so that we can better ourselves and just being empowered through community and storytelling. Because if you get into a deep conversation with somebody, there's going to be something that connects you to that person. So we just love bringing on people from all different walks of life to share their stories with us and to just learn. And I am super excited to learn today. We have an amazing guest on. Uh, Her name is Megan. You guys know her from the Feeding Littles account on Instagram. They have tons of online courses for baby led weaning, how to feed your toddler, getting picky eaters to eat. And she's agreed to come on the podcast and give us tons of information for free. So how cool is that? Uh, Megan's going to be joining us and answering tons of the listener questions, which I'm sure are a lot of questions that you guys have as well. So I'm not going to wait any longer. I'm going to go ahead and get her on. I have Megan McNamee. I said it wrong. McNamee. That, yep. McNamee. I wrote it down McNamee. then I just said it. <laughs> Megan Everyone McNamee it here. Yay, um, yes. yes. We're so Holy. excited to have you on here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. My maiden name was Hammer. So it was so easy. A Nobody little bit easier. <laughs> I tell my, I blame my husband every day. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, uh, thanks for being on and just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you kind of started this amazing page where you help people every day learn how to feed their kids. Sure. So essentially, I've, I've worked as a dietitian in many capacities for many years. And right when I was nine months pregnant with my first baby, I got laid off from my um, startup job in medical device research and clinical trials. And it's funny, like going through it, you're like, oh my gosh, what does this mean? And why is this happening to me? And But it's ironic because I really needed to make a shift and a change. And the universe finally told me like, well, if you're not going to do it on your own, we're going to force you to do it. And so I ended up starting, I actually worked at a birth center. I was taught, um, I started teaching some prenatal nutrition classes there. And they came to me and said, we want you to teach a baby led weaning class. And I said, that's great, but I don't have any idea what that is. <laughs> this was back in 2013 and nobody really was talking about it much. Just some of my mom friends that were very progressive in their thinking. And so I said, okay, that's fine. But I want to do a lot of research into it. And I want to try it with my own kid. So I did. And I held my first class like a month after um, and I laugh because I'm like, oh my gosh, what in the world did I say in that first <laughs> class? Four people. Um, and since then, I've done, you know, multiple um, literature reviews, like for state agencies, and I've, you know, spoken about it nationally. And it's kind of evolved into this really cool thing where it was, I was one of the only people teaching classes on it. And that was great until everyone's baby turned into a toddler. Mm. And toddlers are very different with food. And most, many of you that are listening know what I'm talking about. Your, your baby that ate anything and everything suddenly has an opinion. And this is normal, um, but it's frustrating for parents because they don't have the tools to deal with it. They think, you know, they just do what their parents did with them. Well, you have to eat that. You know, you have to finish your plate. You have to eat that to get your dessert, et cetera. So I was kind of wondering, you know, I know what to put on the plate for toddlers. I just don't know how to get them to eat it. And at this, right around the same time, a good friend of mine introduced me to Judy, who's my business partner. And Judy was the feeding therapist for her little boy, Jack. Um, and he passed away from a terminal um, genetic condition in 2011. And she just said, you know, you need to meet this woman. She's amazing with food and getting pe- kids to eat. And I had never even heard of feeding therapy before. And she and I talked for two hours the first time we got on the phone and we knew we had to do something. So we released the toddler course about a year later, 18 months later, let me tell you. Doing an online course takes a lot longer than you expect. Um, And it was just an interesting journey into that. And at the time, we had a Facebook group. So we were just kind of talking about it on our Facebook group. And then we started doing Instagram. And about another year later, we released our our infant course. So it's kind of been this weird... You know, people have these business plans. And he's like, this is my vision. This is what I'm doing. And ours has happened so by accident. Um, By, you know, beautiful accident. Like, we feel so blessed and lucky to do this. But... You know, people ask all the time, like, how did you get to where you are? And we're like, I, I'm not really sure. I think we just try to 
relate to our audience and give them information that we want. And that's, that's all we can do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you guys have done a wonderful job. Uh, I was telling you before we recorded, I was asking in the Facebook group questions that they had for you and every, and everybody was like, Oh my gosh, I love her so much. I cannot wait for this. She's helped me so much. I love following her page. So, um, like the work that you guys are doing are awesome. And I know I've posted, stuff on the Miraculous Mamas page because I always try to give just like little tips that I can find, um, whether it's for mamas dealing with postpartum or trying to feed your kids and you guys just have, it's like so easy to go look and get a little takeaway, even just ideas, you know, for what should I try to feed my kids or I have no idea like what to put on their plate tonight. And you always have that type of information up there, which, which is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's a cool, I have to say, it's definitely my dream job. Oh, that's and awesome. Really, yeah. I mean, I, this is what I went essentially my whole career led up to this. I just didn't know it. Yeah. <laughs> so very cool. Yeah. Oh, it's so awesome when things do just align like that. Yep. I know. It makes you really like believe, you know, when they say things happen for a reason and sometimes it's really hard when you're in that mm-hmm. in like a tough phase and you're like, what could this reason be? And then when you get to look back and see the, you know, gain perspective, it's kind of amazing to, to understand how things played out. So that's been cool for us. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. This episode is brought to you by Love Every. That's L-O-V-E-V-E-R-Y. Love Every is an award-winning children's playtime company that's reimagining what kids' toys can be. Love Every play products are science-backed and distilled to their simplest, purest purpose to be exactly what children need and want at each stage of development. The network structure of your baby's brain is formed in its first few years. And the more that you expose your baby to early developmental exercises, the richer these neural networks become. And Love Every products are designed by child development experts to foster cognitive development during this important time and to make it easier for modern parents to give their kids the best possible start in life. And Love Every is a parent-run company and they've done the research so that you don't have to. They offer a subscription box service, which consists of play kits that are amazing. Love Every's play kits are beautifully designed and carefully curated with the best science-backed, eco-friendly, and non-toxic toys that your baby or toddler will benefit from and love to play with. Each play kit is designed to foster development at a specific stage in your child's young life, building their physical, cognitive, visual, and motor skills on schedule as they grow. The play kits start at zero to 12 weeks and continue all the way to 24 months, taking your child from basic visual and sensory experiences to early stages of vocabulary, imagination, and problem solving. The thing that I love about the kits is all the different stages that my friends are having babies right now or in the first couple years of life, I never know what to get kids. Like the toys section can be so overwhelming for me and I know it is for a lot of people. And what do you get a one-year-old or a six-month-old or, you know, it's, it's so hard figuring out what to get them. But with Love Every, I love that whatever I choose it's going to be something that helps the child development. It's going to help them learn and grow and that it's non-toxic and safe. That is so important to me when buying gifts for friends. I also love that I can just go on here and get a subscription for one of my friends having a baby um, and that a box will come to them every few months with exactly what the kid needs. So that is just, it makes it so simple for me and to be able to trust in a product like this and um, know that I am sending them something that they can actually use and need. And their play kits, they were named one of the best inventions of 2018 by Time Magazine. And experts agree, this is a smarter way to engage your child and make playtime meaningful. And They have a deal for all of you. Right now, Love Every is offering the listeners $15 off new play kit subscriptions. And if you're like me, you're going to want your child to have all of them. This offer is only available for a limited time and only when you visit loveevery.com slash babies and use the code babies at checkout. That's L-O-V-E-V-E-R-Y dot com slash babies to check out all of the incredible play kits that Love Every offers, and you'll save $15 off your subscription with the code BABIES. We thank Love Every for sponsoring the podcast. And remember, when you support our sponsors, you help make this podcast possible. Um, so I have tons of questions for you. Um, 
from the Facebook group audience, which I know kind of reaches a wide audience as well. Um, But one thing that a lot of people have asked, and I've seen this over and over, just with moms in the group asking each other even, is how can I get my kid, like a two-year-old, to even lick a vegetable? (laughs) To even try to... Like, they're like, I can't even get them to do anything. Like, just get them to lick one. How do I get them to do that? So this is a big, a big question, a bigger answer than I would probably have time to talk about because we actually have a whole course about this. Um, but I'll give you guys a, you know, a few tidbits first and foremost. Um, if you force your child to eat that, that that particular food, I don't know if it, if you've ever been forced to eat something, it kind of sets up this, um, kind of resistance. We're naturally kind of inclined to want to do our own thing, especially as young kids, they're learning independence and they're learning that they can say no. And if we force them to eat something, I mean, sometimes they'll do it in the short run, but oftentimes they'll push back and it will make them not really interested in trying that food at all. Um, some of you even have memories of this from your childhood and there, you might not even eat that food at all. Like I still being, remember being forced to eat raisins and I won't even go near them now. My lovely fall, you know, audience on Instagram knows it's like a whole joke that I hate raisins and like, don't even bring me near them. Um, but my grandma made me eat them. And I, you know, and, and so many people have those experiences. If we make our children eat food, we force it to force them to eat that food that we're stepping over the line. We're stepping over kind of our boundary of what's our job and what's their job. And, um, there's a a lot of interesting work by a dietitian named Ellen Satter, in what she calls the division of responsibility. And we, we kind of loosely go off of DOR, but we integrate it with some other theories. And the idea is that you're responsible for providing the food and they're responsible for how much is eaten. So you're in charge of the meals and snack times at a regular place, um, you know, at a frequency so that they're not getting too hungry, but you don't want to just put food out all day long because then they're not really feeling those hunger and fullness signals. And they're responsible for eating or not eating. Now, Some kids, you know, who really struggle with food, they'll just not eat or they won't eat that one type of food forever and ever and ever. Um, And first off, it's super important to put that vegetable on the plate so that they see it. That's like rule number one. If we don't expose our children to foods, we can't expect them to learn how to eat them. It can take 20 to 30 exposures of one food for a child to know how to eat it. And that's a lot. Um, And... So we talk actually a lot about in the toddler course about all these pre-meal rituals to kind of get your child in the, in the mindset of eating so that things are normal and um, kind of expected, just like a bedtime routine, right? The child kind of knows, okay, this is what's happening next. This is what's happening next. And that, those pre-meal rituals are helpful because they, um, they kind of get them in the zone of eating when they might've been playing or distracted by something else and they don't really want to come to the table. And then we talk a lot about some use of like certain techniques like food chaining and novelty that allow children to explore food without being um, forced to eat it. And this is kind of what they do in feeding therapy with kids who are really struggling. Mm. It's interaction with food. It's touching it, playing with it, kissing it. Can you touch it to your nose? Can you touch it to your cheek? And, you know, we were brought up being told, don't play with your food. But children will learn about their world through play. Hmm. That's how they learn about everything. And if we expect them to come to the table and be faced with a food that looks really intimidating and scary to them, that they don't know what to expect it's going to taste like, like the last time they ate something green, they didn't like it. So now they're like, oh, I see another green thing. This is a little scary. If we don't make it at least somewhat child appropriate, where we calm some of those fears, they're going to be less likely to want to eat it. So one thing that you can try at home, we have tons of these ideas in the toddler course, but um, utilizing like a novelty utensil, like a toothpick, if your kid is not going to stab themselves in the mouth or the eye, like this is more for like a two to three-year-old and older. Yeah. Um, but see if they can pick up the food with a toothpick. They might not necessarily eat it right away, but they're more likely to at least interact with it. And that's a pre-feeding step that will get them down that road. It's just like when you go to Costco and your kids eat everything out of the little tiny cup Hmm. and then you buy the 12 pound package of it because you're like, oh, they finally, they like this. They're going to eat it. And you get home and they don't eat it. 
it's not because they liked the food all that much necessarily. It's because they ate it out of a tiny cup with a toothpick. Mm -hmm. So um, we just encourage our readers or our audience to get in there and have fun and play a little bit um, and not be so worried about them getting, you know, it's okay for your kid to pretend their piece of, you know, broccoli or whatever is a car and run the car into the hummus or whatever. It's okay for them to get messy. It's okay for them to explore. If we make mealtime more positive and more fun for them, they're more likely to want to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes total sense. All right. So I have a little confession to make. I love cooking dinner. I really, really do. But there are just times where either I'm busy or I'm just not feeling it. And I would feel so guilty if I didn't cook dinner and like, Vito's getting home from work and I'm like, oh man, I didn't cook. I don't know what to eat. But do you know what helps me not feel guilty is DoorDash because I can just order something and get it delivered to the to our house so he and I can still spend time together and order what we really want to eat. I can leave my sweatpants on and not stress about dinner when I have those days because DoorDash makes it so easy. They connect you to your favorite restaurants in your city and ordering is so simple. You open the DoorDash app, choose what you want to eat, and your food will be delivered to you wherever you're at. Not only is your favorite pizza joint already on DoorDash, but there are over 340,000 restaurants in 3,300 cities. So you might find a new favorite too. With door-to-door delivery in all 50 states in Canada, order from your local go-tos or choose from your favorite national restaurants like Chipotle, Wendy's, Chick-fil-A, and the Cheesecake Factory. Uh, Don't worry about dinner. And don't feel bad if you didn't have time to worry about dinner that day and let dinner come to you with DoorDash. And right now, our listeners can get $5 off their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter promo code MAMAS. That's $5 off your first order when you download the DoorDash app from the App Store and enter promo code MAMAS. Don't forget, that's promo code MAMAS for $5 off your first order from DoorDash. Does like one bite of broccoli really make a difference? Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. So we try to encourage people think long term. Mm-hmm. Turning your children off from vegetables altogether because you for- got them to eat, you know, the whole serving once is not helpful. When you think of okay, but if we create this positive environment and we create positive food associations, and they eventually eat it every time it's served or most times it's served then we've accomplished the long-term goal. Maybe we don't have the short-term goal in mind, but at least we're not turning them off from that food for the rest of their life. And that's kind of what, you know, I think people look at like one meal at a time. And we encourage parents to look at one week at a time, like one week of food at a time. Mm -hmm. Are we balancing out over that longer term? And vegetables are super important. And that people, you know, get very worried and obsessed about vegetables. I understand like, I get it. We, I encourage all my adult clients to, you know, add more vegetables to their day, but you can find a lot of the same nutrition and vegetables in fruits. Your child won't be malnourished if they're not eating vegetables and they're only eating fruit. It's not ideal, but I think what happens is when we start to freak out so much about what they're eating, we sit there and kind of micromanage their bites in, we kind of create this negative dynamic in the long run. We kind of shoot ourselves in the foot. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's one thing that we want our parents to take away from when they take our courses. It's kind of like the sense of what is your job? How do you know if your kid is getting enough? You know, where's the line that that's drawn and where do you stop? Because when you keep stepping over the line, that's when you set up yourself for failure in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. I mean, I think that the, I don't have tons of memories, I guess, with food as a kid. I just remember, um, feeding my dog under the table when I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> but I mean, you, I, you learn as the kid, the like airplane, right? Everybody right. does the airplane to feed you. And I remember that right. was something when I would babysit, I'd be like, okay, open up. Right. <laughs> you know? I know. I'm like making fun. I know. Well, it's funny with baby. Like when, when you're actually being, when you're actually feeding a baby, it's so funny because we want babies to be like choosing to eat. And a lot of times when people are like spoon feeding, what they'll do is they'll, wait till baby's distracted and kind of slip the, the spoon in their mouth. And it's funny, my kids will sometimes try to feed me. You know, they'll be <laughs> next to me 
I'm like, why are you doing this? I never made, I never did this to you. Like, why are you doing this to me? And they're like trying to force feed me. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'll be looking the other direction and they'll just, they'll be like, mommy, try it. And like shove it in my mouth. And, and it's very jarring. <laughs> Like when you're not, when you're not aware that the process is happening and all of a sudden there's food going in your mouth, it's like, whoa, this is, um, this is a little unsettling. Just, I wasn't expecting that, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it sounds, I mean, it's funny how some of our memories, we have distinct memories of food growing up and how some of them can either be positive or negative and Mm -hmm. how that can influence us moving forward. I mean, it's probably a good thing you don't have a ton of memories about food because that means you don't have any trauma around food or any yeah. like no bad stuff. But I bet you also have good associations with food, like celebrations, you know, certain family foods or traditions that were brought to the table. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I I love food. <laughs> I love you're supposed food. to love food. I know. Um, all right. So this lady asks, how do I get my nine-month-old to not just eat purees from a pouch and eat actual table food? Ooh, these are really big questions. These people are, they're dealing with some good <laughs> stuff, um, which I understand. Like this is the crux of my job every day. So um, pouches are hard because some of your listeners might have experienced this before. They're kind of an, a passive, you know, pouches are, right? They're like this little squeeze, yeah. little squeeze pockets. Um, they're kind of a passive way of eating. So it's period, it's ba- essentially baby food um, that's put into this little packet. And you don't have to really suck or do much. You just have to squeeze the packet to get the food to come out. So they're very convenient and people like them because, you know, especially for people that who have pickier eaters or aren't, aren't comfortable with giving their babies like salt foods in whole forms, it's like, okay, this is an easy way for them to get a little bit of, you know, kale or something in, in a period, period form. The problem with pouches is that um, they kind of make eating a very passive experience. So you don't really have to chew. You don't have to taste. You don't taste what the food tastes like. Most pouches are actually pear or apple flavored. They're made with that as the first ingredient. So they all taste kind of like a fruit puree. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're not experiencing like the the look of the food, the smell of the food. It's all kind of a very um, benign experience. So when babies like pouches and that's kind of all they're doing, it can be challenging to get them off of those. And in some cases, some families just choose, you know, we we don't think you have to never serve pouches, but I understand, you know, a frustration if that's all your baby's eating and you want them to move on. In those cases, sometimes families just choose to go cold turkey with the pouches so that they can start getting them exposed to food and kind of in its whole form or at least squeezing the pouch into a, like a bowl or on the tray and giving them loaded spoons so that baby can feed themselves and be a little bit more active in that experience. Um, so in her case, I would probably either decide if she wants to, you know, eliminate them altogether for a little bit or um, give them to baby kind of on loaded spoons like that so that at least they're getting used to self-feeding a little bit more um, dynamic process. And most you know, there's kind of a myth that goes around the interwebs and it's actually, I can identify where it comes from. It comes from one specific article about starting solids. It's on a breastfeeding website. Um, and unfortunately it's just not correct. It says that your baby has to have a pincer grasp to be able to have whole foods. Um, a baby's pincer grasp, which is the thumb, the tip of the thumb to the tip of the index finger, uh, which is, a, you know, it makes a perfect circle. That's like the real pincer grasp there. That doesn't usually def- refine until your baby is 10 to 12 months old. So most, you know, six, seven, nine month olds can't pick up little tiny pieces of food. And that's why we actually really like teaching baby led weaning or infant self-feeding because it, we start with bigger pieces of food. They learn how to pick it up. They hold it in their palm, kind of as in a palmer grasp. I wish you guys could see me. I'm doing it with my hand, but it's, you know, imagine grabbing kind of like a, a spear of avocado with your palm and then the top of the avocado pokes out your hand. And then you don't have to have that, you know, refined grasp to be able to open your hand, that palmer release or a pincer grasp to be able to get that food to your mouth. You can just bring it to your mouth. Baby brings it to their mouth and they guide it towards the back gums, chew and swallow. So I would start doing that for a baby who's struggling to transition. Um, we actually, a lot of families utilize our infant course with that because it helps them understand how to do baby weaning safely and from an evidence-based perspective so that they don't feel like they're just kind of, you know, doing mm-hmm. it alone. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, guys. I know that we are answering tons of questions in this episode about what to feed your kids. Um, But for your kids that are a little bit older, I have the perfect snack for you and for adults as well. Uh, It's my favorite health bar. It tastes like cookie dough and it is delicious and it has a bunch of superfoods in it. So you feel healthy when you eat it. Um, Perfect Snacks. And it is a line of fresh from the fridge protein bars that are made from freshly ground nut butter and up to 17 grams of whole food protein, and 20 superfoods, all combined to create a cookie dough-like texture that is just as nutritious as it is delicious. And the Perfect Kids are snack bars crafted especially for the kiddos. Eight kid-friendly superfoods, a bar size just for them, and that same amazing cookie dough-like texture and taste that you and your kids will love. Um, Their products are kept refrigerated for optimal texture and taste, and they stay fresh up for up to one week outside of the fridge. They're perfect to take on the go wherever you need a snack and to help avoid any meltdowns. And trust me, (laughs) even Vito and I have meltdowns. There's this like tipping point where I'm hangry that I'm like, oh my gosh, I need something right now. And that's perfect bars are my go-to. And it's Vito's favorite snack when he gets home from work while I'm cooking dinner because he's always starving. He works so hard and he loves to just grab one of these bars. And he's actually really picky about the bars that he likes and he loves the perfect bars. Um, The dark chocolate peanut butter is amazing and the peanut butter. And I love coconut. So the coconut peanut butter for me. And they also have an almond butter flavor. So you're not going to have to sacrifice any taste for health. And They're an amazing snack that not only tastes good, but helps you feel good because it's non-GMO, project verified, gluten-free, soy-free, kosher, low GI, and made in the USA. And right now, Perfect Bar is offering you 15% off your online order. Just go to perf.bar slash mamas. Shop the refrigerated section of their snacks at perf.bar slash mamas today to get 15% off your order. Make your day a little more perfect at perf.bar slash mamas. So I didn't know too much about baby lead weaning and it's something that I do hear a lot about now and you do hear a lot of mixed things on it. Um, Mm -hmm. Like at what age would you recommend starting baby lead weaning or is it kind of something that a kid kind of decides on their own? So we recommend starting it at six months when you would start giving your child solid foods. Um, and, you know, we don't recommend any food until they're around six months old and they're sitting um, for a variety of kind of biodynamic um, and like body placement reasons. Um, like that's getting more into my my business partner's world, the OT world. Um, so even if you want to do spoon feeding and purees from the start, we still recommend around six months. And that's actually kind of the guidance from World Health Organization, Health Canada, AAP, et cetera. Um, so right when you start solids, you can skip that, that part. If you want, not do the spoon feeding with the purees and just go straight to giving them the strips of food. Some parents, um, get too stressed out about gagging and, and they're worried about safety. And I, that's completely understandable. That's kind of what, why we teach it the way we teach it. Um, and for some families, it doesn't work out for them, but we want babies transitioning to other, pure, other textures besides purees by no later than nine months. That's kind of what the data suggests is correlated with like feeding issues later on in life. And we want kids exclusively self-feeding by 12 to 14 months, like at the latest, unless there's some medical issues going on. So baby led weaning really is how do they start? It just means how are you starting this a little bit differently? And what we like about it is it gives your child autonomy with how much is going in their mouth. You can overfeed a baby if you're you know putting food into their mouth, if you're not watching for those cues. And... It, you know, it's nice when they can feed themselves and you can feed yourself, you know, and kind of be at the table enjoying all the same foods together. Mm-hmm. Um, but we recognize that it doesn't work for every family. There's just so many resources out there for spoon feeding that we didn't, we didn't feel like it made sense for us to create another one. We wanted to do something that was unique and that people needed and that, you know, we, we felt was cool for a lot of families who, um, who wanted to go that route. And it's funny, like I started teaching this and everyone, my, my friends, like everyone around me thought it was crazy because nobody had ever heard of it before. And it, it's funny now, I think it's gotten so much more and people have seen so many clients doing it now. You know, we post, repost a lot of people's stories. It's like way more, it's way more popular in the media. A lot of other people are doing it now. And now it's, 
a lot of those people are coming around, you know, my friends are now buying the infant course for their second or third baby when they wouldn't have considered doing that with their first. It's just something I think people had to get used to. Yeah. Um, but baby, like baby food and puree feeding is not, it's actually a pretty recent phenomenon. It's only been around for the past 100 years or so because that's how long we've actually had commercialized baby food. Mm-hmm. Before then, people didn't have Vitamixes and baby food delivery systems and all right. that. You know, babies actually ate, you know, sometimes they would mash it if they could, but like as, a, as far as like a true puree, we didn't really have the technology to do that all that well. Um, and babies kind of ate hunks and pieces of what their parents were eating. Mm-hmm. So it's funny because people call it like new, baby living is new, but it's actually how babies were fed for right. millennia. Right, before. yeah. Yeah, I feel like I see that a lot lately, like things that happened a long time ago, but then they kind of went back and now a lot of that ancient wisdom is coming out again. You right. know, I see right. that a lot. You know, if, you, if nobody ever told you how to feed a baby and you never had seen or weren't familiar with any babies yeah. eating you probably would just start trying to give your baby some food. Maybe you would give them little tiny pieces and realize they couldn't pick it up. Um, but yeah, it was really funny when I started actually doing like looking at the evidence and I realized that, you know, the governing bodies, like recommendations on in infant feeding, they all start, they start saying finger foods at like six to seven months. So essentially you're just skipping the part where you're putting pure, you know, pureed baby food in your mouth. You're just going straight to the finger foods, which has always been okay. You know, recommended around this age anyway. Um, one time I sat next to, and like I was telling you, I feel like this whole journey has been just, you know, heaven sent. I sat next to this guy when I had a, my first was about eight months old and I just started teaching the class and I was used to getting people kind of staring at my child, feeding herself because again, at the time it was even six years ago, it wasn't that popular. And, you know, a lot of times people would say, oh gosh, how could she eat that? Or, oh my gosh, I can't believe your baby's eating so well. And this guy just was staring at her and I'm thinking, oh, okay, what is he going to say? And he goes, your baby's going to have really good teeth. <laughs> and I was like, uh, all right. That's kind of random. I said, you know, are you, are you a dentist? And he goes, actually, I'm a professor of dental anthropology and I specialize in weaning and how babies are introduced to solid foods across cultures and across time. Wow. And I was like, well, first off, that's a job. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, he was, you know, this like guru in how babies learn how to eat and how that affected their dentition. Wow. And looking at like, you know, um, old remains of skeletons and understanding like how their teeth were formed and how their jaw strength and everything. And he was, and this is again, right before baby living even was a thing. And I think he was stunned to see a baby being fed real food. And he said, this is so cool. I said, this is what I literally like look at all day. And we're finding that, you know, humans are now um, kind of lacking the, they're not chewing their food as much as we used to in the past. Yeah. And think, you know, we have a lot of kind of dissolvable, meltable, pureed or, you know, liquid foods now available for kids. If you go in, you know, any kid food section in a grocery store, it's like tons of pouches and um, yogurt melts and puffs and that kind of thing. And which those are all fine if you want to use them, but they're making up such a majority of kids diets that they're not learning to chew. They're not using those important oral muscles. And, and, you know, that's how the gums strengthen. That's how the jaw strength strengthens is actually eating by eating food. And it eventually helps develop those speech skills because Mm -hmm. they need their tongue and their mouth muscles to be coordinating correctly so that they can talk. So anyway, it was just a really um, weird, interesting experience, but I still hold that in the back of my head because I just knew that that guy was sitting next to me right at that exact right time for a reason. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah we just, you know, it's, we, we saw babies being fed so much that we don't, it's hard to, for us to see outside that norm to see something else. But parents tell us all the time, like, once I got into it a few weeks into it, like, oh my gosh, this is, this is pretty cool. And if you've tried it and it's not working for you, that's okay too. You know, every baby's a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So anybody who knows me knows that I am a floss freak. <laughs> I 
if I don't floss my teeth, like honestly for a day, I'll think about it the next day. I have to floss my teeth every single day and I'm huge on oral care. But did you know that there's another level of oral care besides just brushing your teeth and flossing? Uh, You can remove stains that lie beneath the surface of your smile with ARC. ARC is a new way to achieve professional level teeth whitening at home for just 30 minutes a day. Are you getting ready for a new interview or a big event in your life, getting married, or you just want whiter teeth? ARC is there for you. And each ARC treatment includes dentist approved enamel safe whitening strips that adhere to your upper and lower teeth along with the ARC blue light technology. The blue light mouthpiece arcs around your entire smile, delivering targeted blue light energy to help weaken sudden stains below the enamel's surface, making your treatment more effective. Below the surface. I didn't even know that that was possible. And they help you reveal a smile that is 50 times wider than the leading whitening toothpaste. And they offer satisfaction guaranteed. And to help our listeners get a wider, brighter smile, ARC is offering $15 off your purchase of a blue light kit when you visit arcsmile.com and use promo code MAMAS at checkout. Go to arcsmile.com and use promo code MAMAS for $15 off your blue light whitening kit. That's arcsmile.com, promo code MAMAS. So for people starting the baby led weaning process and they want a few healthy ideas to feed little ones, do you just have like a couple of easy, healthy things to start introducing? Sure. Um, So, I mean, the good thing is there's so many options. So essentially think of any fruit, vegetable, protein food, um, whole grain, pretty much all of those are, are a go. So we we talk about cutting or cooking if they're if it's not soft in its natural form for example like a, a peach which you could you know cut with a fork or um a banana if it's not like that then you need to cook it and you know what you would normally do for broccoli you know cauliflower and zucchini and that kind of thing you can cook it however you like it with whatever spices or flavorings you want we just say go easy on the salt try to avoid giving baby a lot of salt but you can use um black pepper we were talking about earlier you can use garlic and turmeric and basil and all those yummy things you can use any oil you want our favorites include olive oil um, avocado oil coconut oil and um so think of you know what are your favorite veggies do you like eggplant you can give that to baby you can give them um broccoli you can give them zucchini you can give them carrot if it's you know cooked you can give them fruits a lot of people think you can't do fruits if you're doing vegetables, you know, you have to do vegetables before fruit, but we don't have a lot of good data to prove that that's actually accurate. And if you avoid giving fruit, you're, you're kind of missing kind of that boat on where they're going to be accepting of a lot of new flavors. Um, I did that kind of by accident because I don't eat as much fruit as vegetables. So I just naturally gave my baby way more vegetables. It took me a really long time to get her to eat fruits. Um, and I was so much different with her sister. I gave her vegetables and fruits and she's just way more, her palate with fruits is just way more varied than her sister. Um, that's obviously just personal experience, but it's just an interesting kind of, you know, observation between the two of them. Um, but you know, you can, you can do avocado, you can do cooked apple, like apple is a choking hazard if it's raw and it's whole in its whole form, but sauteed apple in some coconut oil with some cinnamon is amazing and tasty for everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like all of us like to eat that whenever (laughs) I've made that before for like different photo shoots and things. And everyone in the whole house is coming over like, what's going on? What are we making? Like, would you like a slice of apple (laughs) with some cinnamon on it? Because that's what it is. It makes your house smell like Christmas too. I know. I know. Totally worth it just for that. So um, you can do, you know, banana, you can do mango, you can do... Any kind of fruit that you think of, essentially, if it's really small, you can, you know, put it on a loaded fork or like load it onto a fork with really rounded tines and hand it to baby. Or if it's a, if it's a perfect round circle like a grape, we recommend quartering it. Um, and then you would have to put it on a loaded fork or put it in something thicker like oatmeal or yogurt so that they could have more grip to pick it up. Yeah. You were, you were saying that apples are a choking hazard. At what age do they become not? Four. Four years old? What? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know. And it's so funny. It seems like forever, but my youngest is about to turn four. Mm-hmm. And it's I think it's just because of my job. It's like such a big, big age in my mind because I'm like, oh, 
it's not like something miraculous is going to happen the second she turns four, but it's just the guidelines based on like what we think the majority of kids have an adequate oral skill to be able to safely eat those foods. And we've had three-year-olds documented like in, in the U S in the last year or two choking on raw carrots. Mm. And a lot of people, you know, carrots and apples, like that's what you think of when you think of like kid meals, you know? Yeah. That's the first thing that came to my mind. Yeah. People are always like, well, you can put an apple in there. And I, you know, and my, in the back of my head, I'm like, okay, we have to modify that because it, it technically is considered a choking hazard. So we recommend if you're going to offer an apple raw, you would like shred it with a cheese grater or, um, cook it or cut it really, really thin. Mm-hmm. Or you can, you know, offer it as applesauce on a loaded spoon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so a lot of, one person asked here, and I know a lot of people that this happens to, um, they've done mostly baby led weaning since seven months and they're now 12 month old. He will stuff his mouth super full and, um, he's choked a few times and always kind of recovered, but it's like, so anxious watching the parents, you know, watching their kids stuff their mouth. But, um, like, is there a way to, and I I know parents with kids who are like two, three, four, that they just take the biggest bites and they stuff their mouth so full. And then they kind of leave it in their mouth for a long time while they're working through it. Um, but it's like scary because the kids can choke. So how, how do you help them, I guess, learn not to just stuff their mouth so full? a really good question. So there's an element of this that can be normal and there's an element that of this can that can indicate indicate further problem. And I'm speaking literally just pretend that I'm Judy right now because this is all her and I <laughs> she's talking all of this and I hope I don't butcher it. Um we actually have a blog post about this that I can send you a link okay, for. Yeah, it's that'd be great. Mouth stuffing and food pocketing. Um part of its exploration and children are just trying to, you know, maybe they're, they're so excited and they're, they want to eat it as fast as possible. It's like you try, you know, your, your favorite restaurant for the first time since you've lived in that city and you're just so excited to eat that food. But, um, part of it is, can be that they're struggling to feel the, the confines of their mouth. They're struggling to feel where the back and the sides of the mouth are in their cheeks and, um, kind of adding more and more food kind of helps them feel those boundaries but obviously it's not a good or safe thing. We don't want them pocketing food in their cheeks because then they go and lay down for their nap and suddenly they've got food in their mouth when they're laying down. Um, or we don't want it, you know, we don't want it to be such a stressful experience. It's not an, an kind of a normal feeding behavior to just shove everything in at once and then just wait 10 minutes while we try to figure out how to get it down. So um, we talk about in that, and I'm not going to remember all the points of that blog post, but we do talk about um, giving them one piece at a time that can sometimes slow them down. Offering them sips of water between um, for babies, have them work with the the teethers that we recommend because it helps them understand, like it helps them bite down with the back molar space kind of in the back of their gums. And it helps them understand where things are in their mouth because they're more like a, the stick-shaped teethers that we recommend. So when they chew on them, they, like when they put them in their mouth, they know if they go straight back, that's where their gag reflex is. If they go to the side, you know, that's where their gums are, but they might hit the back of their mouth. And they just kind of help strengthen the jaw and the mouth and the gums. Um, but also for older kids, you know, sometimes just teaching them about bite sizes can help. So Judy plays a game where she says, you know, let's take a little tiny mouse bite. And now let's take a kitty cat bite. Let's take a dog size bite. So they start to learn that we don't have to put huge amounts in our mouth. Let's start, you know, pull it back and do little tiny bites at a time. And that can really help them visualize what they're supposed to be doing and set that kind of pattern. Like if they do it over and over again, you don't have to keep reminding them of it um, as often at least, but it, it kind of helps them remember like we don't, we don't need to put huge bites of food in our mouth. We can keep sticking with those mouse bites, little tiny bites. Um, and then, you know, let's chew, chew, chew. Let's swallow together. Let's take a sip of water. Those things can really help them kind of slow themselves down but if you find that it's just keeps happening and none of this is helping, it might be time to get an evaluation because it might just be struggling to, to it, it can, can sometimes be a sensory thing. They're not integrating that, um, in, that information from their mouth. They're not feeling their mouth like they should, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, you know, we have families that they're like, well, my kids just, you know, pockets food and has been doing that for years. And we recommend at that point, it's time to talk to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So another thing that a lot of people want to know is um, how do you get baby to put food in their mouth and instead of just throwing it on the floor? <laughs> That's something that comes with time. Again, those stick shaped teethers really help. Mm-hmm. So we're, and so I'm talking about like, for those of you that are familiar with some of the stuff at the store, like the Komotomo teether that has the prongs or Zoli has a few that have little like kind of like bunny ears on them. Most of the teethers that we get like at our baby shower or that we buy at the store are for the front teeth, which those are fine too. But we also want to develop where the back teeth are going to go. We want them to be biting down on tools that kind of, that are safe for them that go with that back, you know, back gum space. Cause that's where food is going to go. So definitely work with those teethers. And what we tell parents, if your baby is not figuring food out, they probably just need more practice. Mm -hmm. They need to see you eating. So try not to just get put food there and then like, you know, clean the dishes or whatever, make sure you're eating with them and showing them modeling for them what to do. And if they're not getting it with one meal a day, try two meals a day, try three meals a day. I know it's annoying. Um, but it's just like learning an instrument. Some people pick it up really fast and some people don't, it's definitely not a skill that every kid gets right away. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's easy to get frustrated because we're like, oh, you know, he's not doing it. I'm just not going to, I'm just going to stop trying, but that's actually when they, it can get even worse. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's something you always see though. Like when kids are learning to eat at some point, they're going to throw food on the floor. Yes. Well, that's another, you know, sometimes they throw food because they just realize that gravity exists. If you think about it, it is a little bit of an amazing concept. They're not usually up high like that with yeah. things in their hands. Like usually when they're with their toys, they're on the ground. So now they're in a high chair and they open up their hand and the thing just disappears. Like it's actually, <laughs> right? If you think about it. Yeah. Like why does that happen? You know, if you had not, no, you know, no seventh grade science knowledge, you'd be like, well, that's, that's kind of weird. Why did it go to the ground? And they're testing it. They're testing gravity. Um, sometimes throwing can mean that they're, done. They're over it. Sometimes kids throw because they're kind of off in the corner and they're feeling kind of left out from the meal. Cause you know, it's easy to kind of put their high chair up in the corner and kind of far away from the table. And children will sometimes seek any sort of, um, reinforcement, even if it's negative, because they're just trying to get that connection. And I hate calling it like attention seeking because it, it is them wanting your attention, but it's also just them wanting your connection. And so right. if, if you're, you know, busy on your phone or you're busy, like with your other kids and baby's off in the corner and there's nothing happening and they start throwing food and you, then you're like, Oh baby, don't do that. And you go over there and you're, you know, talking to them and interacting with them. They start to learn, Oh, if I throw my food, mom's going to come over and, you know, interact with me. Um, and so it kind of gets down to, infant psychology in a lot of ways and toddler psychology, they're not doing things to be purposefully a-holes. They're usually just testing their environment, like trying to figure it out. And they're learning from our responses. Um, If you have our toddler course, we have like a whole handout on this and like what these different behaviors mean and different things to kind of explore with them because it's very normal for a toddler to throw their food. Very annoying, but very, (laughs) very normal. (laughs) Yes, yes. All part of the learning process. Well, uh, and like, it's funny because I think we get so worried. We're in something and we're like, oh God, it's going to be like this forever. Mm-hmm. My kids never throw their food now. They don't, you know, they figured it out eventually. I don't remember. I think it was by one and a half. They stopped dropping their food all the time, maybe a little bit later. And they eventually learn how to use cutlery and how to eat all the different things. And it's just, you know, in the midst of it, it's, it can be really challenging because it makes mealtime a little bit messier and annoying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So somebody asked about um, when her daughter was younger, when they did baby lead weaning, she was so adventurous. She would try everything. Um, And since becoming a toddler, she won't touch anything that isn't cheese, carbs, or fruit. So like, how do you encourage bringing those foods back um, without wasting it, I guess? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I, I feel like I'm not doing justice to these answers because we have such a bigger explanation in our toddler course, but cause it's not as simple as just like one little thing. No, absolutely. Otherwise I would eat. So every toddler would be a, an easy eater if it was just one simple fix. We, t- we, we present like tons of different strategies, but first off, again, if your kid doesn't see it, they're not going to learn how to eat it. 
So if we stop serving it to them, we they're not used to seeing it on their plate anymore. And some kids will even stop even tolerating it on their plate. They won't even have it near them. So even if your kid isn't eating it, and you're probably pretty confident that they won't, don't forget to still give them one piece of it. If you think about it like this, if you were to go to a like a say an Ethiopian restaurant, and this is completely new, completely new cuisine for you. I love Ethiopian food, but a lot of people have never had it before. And you know, they they present it on these huge trays, and it looks different than how you normally eat. And some of it's eaten with your fingers, you know, and they have like this really yummy kind of squishy bread, and I don't know what it's called, but it's really good, and you kind of scoop it. But anyway, if you are kind of a nervous eater, or we'll call you a more selective eater, I don't, I try to avoid labeling people as picky, but say you are just a pickier eater as an adult, and you have this huge tray placed in front of you. It's very overwhelming. It's, it's this kind of inherent expectation that you need to eat all this food. And it might be kind of scary to you because you don't know what to expect with any of this. You have no idea how it's going to taste. It's very similar to how a toddler feels. If you give them this massive portion, they're going to see it as kind of like, oh, I'm supposed to eat all of that? I need to eat all of that? And that's scary. And I don't, I'm overwhelmed. And they can be turned off from the meal entirely because they have a huge serving of, you know, peas on their plate. If we give them one pea, we waste less food. They're less overwhelmed. They're less, they're actually more likely to eat it because it's less overwhelming. And it's kind of like, well, I can have, you know, my answer one pea. And we feel better about the whole situation because they didn't, you know, freak out about it. They might have actually eaten something and we didn't waste a ton of food. People vastly overestimate portion sizes for kids. Um, a toddler serving a vegetable is about a tablespoon. Hmm. Or I'm sorry, a one year old. So the idea is like per year of age, one tablespoon. So a three-year-old will be three tablespoons. And that's really not that much. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us are giving our children four, five, six servings on one plate. And if we were given four adult servings of that food, it would be overwhelming and hard for us to eat that much too. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Even, I mean, as an adult now, I feel like I make smoothies every day. That's how I get most of my vegetables. (laughs) Yeah. You're not alone. Um. And then um, just a few more questions. I know you're just like a pit of information. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> but you guys are just going to have to buy her course to find out everything because there's just too much. Too well, it's, much. Uh, yeah, it's, I don't want to like sound like I'm just selling the course. I just, we have, it's, it takes a few hours to get through and it's, but it's all video based and we literally teach you like what we teach our clients. Mm-hmm. So normally feeding therapy, like an initial session with, and feeding therapy can be two to four hundred dollars and then you know follow-up sessions you know 100 200 bucks um and our toddler course is 69 dollars. so we're trying to make it affordable for families without devaluing their work and it just is um we've now been selling it for about four years and it's so cool to see like the changes in the evolution that people have made in their families because one element that we talk a lot about is intuitive eating and Mm -hmm. Teaching your children to learn and to trust their innate fullness and hunger signals and how to make food more neutral and not make a big deal out of it and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So hard. I mean, I, you know, I said I don't have necessarily bad memories as a kid, but I remember going to people's houses and their parents would make them like, you can't, you can't leave till you finish everything on your plate. And I remember thinking like, Mm -hmm. I'm so glad my parents don't make me do that. (laughs) You know. Yeah, you're like, am I am I part of this rule yeah. here? Uh, this we don't do this house? at my house. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so this uh, lady was asking how she on your Instagram. Sometimes you'll put dessert with dinner or something sweet with lunch. Um, what is the best stage to start giving treats or desserts, and how often? So that totally gets at. Remember, you had asked me before the podcast, like, what's the big thing that's on my mind right now? Yeah. I'm going to go on a little like diatribe if that's okay. Yeah. A little rant. Absolutely. Um, Okay. So we know that sugar is not an extraordinarily health promoting food, but we also know that sugar is part of one of our followers calls it um, mental healthiness, which I love that term. Eating chocolate or eating your favorite dessert when you go out to dinner with your family Mm -hmm. or eating cake on your birthday that's part of, it's part of celebration. It's part of life. And it's a little, 
it's kind of a little, um, for a lot of people, it's kind of sad to think of like, Oh, I'm never going to, I'm, you know, never going to have sugar. I, I enjoy that. That's part of what I enjoy in my day or in my week or whatever, how often you eat it. What we, the balance is we don't want our kids to be eating tons of sugar. And yet if we don't let them have exposure to sugar, they tend to become fascinated by what they can. Yeah. And I have now worked with, you know, thousands of adult clients who just tell me time after time after time about how, you know, their mom didn't allow any sugar in the house and they would go to their friend's house and completely go crazy. They would raid the cupboards and just sit there and eat and eat and eat. Well, isn't it better? And I'm, this isn't just, you know, my experience or my one client's experience. This is, we're talking about lots and lots of people's experience with this. We believe, and the intuitive eating model believes that it, isn't it better for us to be able to manage and maneuver our environment around sugar and have it sometimes without going crazy, completely crazy over it and craving it and having this really horrible relationship with it? Isn't it healthier, if you're going to use that term, isn't it healthier to have some sugar versus no sugar, no sugar, binge, binge, no sugar, no sugar, binge, you know, Mm -hmm. and feeling completely out of control around it. We want, you know, people get really worked up about sugar because they think that kids should never have sugar. And that is a nice way to think about it. Until your kids start going to school, Mm -hmm. until they start going to soccer games and birthday parties. And, you know, everywhere we go, there's, you know, there's different options for sugar. My goal isn't for them to never eat sugar. My goal is for them to know how to manage sugar, Mm -hmm. to know how their body feels when they eat sugar, to know that it's not so special that they need to engorge, you know, gorge themselves, engorge is not the right word, gorge themselves when they see it. And so I think there's this kind of idealistic view about how sugar should be managed and there's no sugar at all. And then there's more of a realistic view of, okay, but it's in our world. It's in our environment. When you go to a birthday party, there's going to be birthday cake for mm-hmm. most families. Yeah. Maybe you don't agree with that, but are you going to keep your child away from the birthday party because of the cake? There's an element of enjoying enjoying our life with foods that contain sugar. Mm-hmm. And so we recommend starting... Now, the official like American Heart Association says no added sugar till two. I've talked to a lot of dietitians about this. It's such a hard line stance that's so much more extreme than they've ever had before. And we think it's kind of an attempt to, you know, when you give like a really high expectation, you're going to be the people that are really Mm -hmm. far away from it up to it a little bit closer. They're probably not going to need it, but they might try a little bit more. I think it's to to try to draw more attention to that. But, you know, bread, most bread has sugar in it, added sugar in it. Yeah. Pasta sauce has added sugar in it. If you're going to buy anything from the grocery store, a lot of cases it will have some added sugar in it. And for some people want to make everything from scratch and go, go that route and never not give their kid any sugar till they're two. But for a lot of families, that's not really that feasible. It also is more realistic for a firstborn child to not have any sugar or desserts, but not so much for a second or yeah. thirdborn. And those mm-hmm. of you listening know what I'm talking about, um, that you have other kids. Um, those younger kids see their older siblings eating that birthday cake. And they want to try some too. And again, I want my kids, I would so much rather my kids grow up with a healthy food relationship and knowing that sugar is not the devil and we can have some here and there and how our body feels about it versus being so fearful of sugar that it's this kind of off limits, you know, thing that they, that they don't know how to handle because we, we won't be in charge of their food forever. Mm -hmm. They're not only going to be at school and those parties, but eventually they're going to be buying their own food. And I, you know, talk to tons of clients whenever we talk about this, about, you know, they went to college and they were so restricted on sugar at home. They literally ate cookies for four years straight. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So how does not eating any sugar throughout your childhood, how is that? But, but then like binging on it for years and years as an adult and feeling out of control, that doesn't help. So yes, we have an issue with sugar. I think we have, it is in too many foods. We do have it around probably too much. I'm not saying that sugar is a health food. But I think it can be a mental health food. I think it can be something that allows us to enjoy life and to enjoy what we're eating. And the more emphasis we place on it, the worse it becomes. Mm -hmm. So what I tell parents is, you know, like like I said, those AHA recommendations are not till two. You can do that if you like. For many families, that's not totally realistic. And they usually, 
a lot of families start like sometime between one and two, you know, here and there, a bite of, you know, cookie or cake or whatever. Um, and we kind of play around with desserts. We do them probably three times a week. We don't do them every night in our family. Every family is going to be different. And usually it's like some dark chocolate or like a dark chocolate peanut butter cup, or sometimes it's a cookie or ice cream or something. Um, sometimes it's like a homemade, like, you know, healthified dessert, whatever. But I sometimes give it to them with the meal, if, especially if it's like, um, you know, you can go to a restaurant and they have the cookie with the kid's meal. They serve it with them, mm -hmm. the meal. If they're getting this little cookie served with their lunch and it's not so huge that it's going to, you know, if they gave them a cookie the size of their their head, maybe I would give them a little piece. But if it's not going to interfere with their appetite and they're going to eat the cookie anyway, just let them have the cookie with the lunch. Because mm -hmm. then, then it's like kind of normalizing the value, quote unquote, of that cookie. And then... But, you know, I also play with it the other way. Sometimes we like dessert. I personally like dessert after I eat my meal. I like the difference of the savory first then kind of ending on a sweet. And a lot of people like eating that way. So when we do that, then we serve it afterwards. I don't announce it. It has nothing to do with how much they ate or didn't eat. Um, it's not a reward or a punishment for anything. Um, my kids are now kind of getting used to... Sometimes they'll ask, you know, can we have a dessert? And I'll say, we're not having that right now. I've been super consistent with them since they were born about this. Um, and or if I'll say, yeah, we're going to have, et cetera. Um, and sometimes I tell them that towards the end of their meal, if they want to leave some space in their bellies. But they're the kids that will give me half the cookie back. Mm -hmm. And they'll, um, yesterday they had ice cream. We were out and all the other kids were getting ices, like those little slushies. And my kids, I don't even know if they've ever had those. And we walked up and, you know, it's so hard for me because that's not something I normally would serve them. But at the same time, when every single one of their friends is having one, mm -hmm. I'm trying to keep this neutrality about that. I'm like, yeah. okay, we can try it if you want. And then they got up to there and they said, oh, there's actually ice cream here. Can we try ice cream instead? And I said, okay, well, we can have ice cream. They eat. And I said, you know, we are going to be eating lunch in about an hour. It's kind of a weird time. Make sure you still have some room in your tummy for your lunch. And both of them handed their ice cream back to me after eating half of it. Yeah. And every kid is going to be different with this, but I grew up in a very diet heavy household. It was Weight Watchers my whole life and foods were good or bad and points rated. And mm -hmm. I honestly, that's why I became a dietitian, honestly, because I grew up kind of food obsessed myself. I thought that everyone needed to be on a diet and I saw food as bad um, or good. And I don't want that for my kids and I don't want that for your kids. I don't want that for anyone's kids because mm -hmm. it's really painful to step out of that. Mm -hmm. it takes a real long time and you miss out. You miss out on the joy of life when you're, when you're so focused just on food. Yeah. Well, and the thing that's hard though is like, food is a part of everything. Like you said, I mean, it's celebrations, but yeah, you eat your meals, but it's any party, any celebration, right. weddings, birthdays, even funerals, yeah. like anything, there's food. Right. Like it's... So we have to learn how to manage it. You do. You we really do. You can't avoid it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's actually hard for, you know, people that deal with, you know, alcoholism or mm -hmm. drug use. And obviously those are very like serious, difficult things to walk away from, but they're it's like abstinence-based therapy, right? Where it's like right. you, to help heal your issues with drugs, you stop using drugs. Or to help heal your you know, issues with alcohol, you abstain from using alcohol. You can't stop eating. Right, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of my clients that have serious eating issues are like, I just wish I could stop eating and not have to think about it. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's, we can't do it. We mm -hmm. don't live that way. Right, no, absolutely. It is, it is really hard. And I, I love your perspective on it though. Your the perspective of creating a healthy relationship with it. And, you know, I would love to talk to you more sometime about intuitive eating, but we don't have <laughs> all the time <laughs> in the world today to do that. I only have a couple more questions for you. Um, how do you encourage a one-year-old to drink out of something besides the boob? The fluid, what fluids or cups, water bottles would you recommend? And how do you incorporate the drinks in with a mealtime? Okay. Um, is it okay if I direct you mainly to a blog post for this? Because sure. we have like tons of, we have Absolutely. a cup drinking post. So um, essentially we do recommend an open cup and a straw cup as the main cups for kids to use. We don't want them to use soft spout sippies or hard spout sippies. Um, the hard spout ones are very, like can be detrimental for speech development and the soft spouts are kind of like a bottle. So you're not 
two, getting two transitioning off of a bottle if your child is using a bottle. Your child's breastfeeding frequently. Um, as a toddler, we still do re recommend that they're drinking a lot of water as well. Breast milk will keep them hydrated, obviously, but we want to get them in the habit of drinking water for the time when they eventually do stop breastfeeding. So we recommend having water after 12 months, water regularly available in like a straw cup or a straw water bottle. Um, or if you're at home, an open cup, if they if they've learned to use that. And we have a blog post all about this, tons of cup recommendations and ideas for this. Um, and if they're not drinking it, um, there's a lot of different ways you can kind of go about this, but sometimes it's helpful to, to make it fun. So like you can cheers your cup with them, you know, and they mm -hmm. hear the clink or, um, you make ice, like if there's a, you know, ice cubes, obviously like, like with the lids, so they're not eating the ice cubes, but you can make ice cubes into shapes that are fun for them. So you can have them help you make ice cubes. And then you can even put like a little blueberry in each ice cube and freeze, freeze it with water. And then when you put their dinosaur ice cubes in their, their water cup, you know, with the lid, then they can see those fun little shapes floating around and you can, you know, do you want, let's drink the dinosaurs together. Again, it's kind of getting back to like putting yourself in your child's foot, you know, shoes, mm -hmm. um, making it fun. You can also try having a tea party or some, you know, using some of their play, um, toys, like those little ceramic tea sets, even, you know, sometimes kids are more likely to drink if it's from a little tiny cup and yeah. they want to just keep filling it over and over and over mm -hmm. again. Now, suddenly they drank 10 ounces of water, but it just took them a long time to keep getting there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really good advice. So def so the blog post is on the Feeding Littles website? Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. and it's just cup, if you just search Feeding Littles cup drinking. Perfect. Um, someone asked, so their son, he had some food aversions. He used, well, he used to throw up a lot before they figured out some issues he was having. He no longer is throwing up, but he's having a hard time figuring out. They're having a hard time figuring out how to convince him that it's safe to eat new foods now. Oh, this is totally a, like more of a feeding therapy question. Mm. So, um, I don't know some, I don't know if this case that they're working with somebody, um, but sometimes it's, if you, here's, I guess, the, the answer to this question that I think can apply to a lot of people. If you feel like your child is just struggling too much, like there's something that's bothering you about how they're eating and you're, you're not able to resolve it. You've taken our toddler course. You've implemented a lot of changes and things just aren't getting any better. It's usually an indicator that they need some more individualized help. Mm -hmm. So in that case, like that would be an, for us an indicator for some private feeding therapy yeah. because even with what we can teach, we, we can't, obviously, if your child needs hands-on, somebody looking in their mouth, somebody working with tools with them, somebody doing some play-based therapy with them, that's something that can't be done, you know, online. Um, and so I would highly encourage you to think about talking to your pediatrician if you feel worried. And a lot of times insurance does cover, you know, feeding evaluations um, and, or partially covers it. And even if they tell you, you know, you're on the right track or we don't see anything out of the ordinary here, then at least you have the peace of mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times our clients, you know, we will say, Oh, I kind of want you to get this evaluated. And a lot of times they'll come back and be like, Oh my gosh, you were, you know, I'm so glad we did this. You were right. They definitely have some, some issues I need to address. And that's why therapy is there. And I think some people get weirded out by the idea of putting their kid in in any kind of therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, you know, um, talk therapy, anything like that. Cause they, I think people worry that they messed up something or they did something wrong or there's something wrong with their child. Um, but therapies exist to kind of, to help them where they're struggling, just like you would help your, you know, if you, if they were struggling in math, you would probably get them a tutor or have, you know, get some extra yeah. help from their teacher. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Right. It's not it's a just, reflection on your parenting. No, no. And some kids are born with certain challenges or certain um, <sighs> tendencies. Mm -hmm. This is just what they do. This is what their body does. This is where they go. This is who they are. And it's okay to seek help for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a couple real quick. Um, best. Oh, okay. Um, one lady just wanted to say thank you so much. She's learned so much from your course. Um, and just advice for 
I don't know if you work with this at all either, just raising two daughters and having that healthy relationship with food and being proud of your body. Oh, that's such a good question. Especially, I don't know if you saw when that like Kerbo thing came out. But, oh, girl. Yeah. Oh, we <laughs> That's were another podcast. That. Oh, yeah. That's another. Oh, God. <laughs> we have a whole post on that on Instagram if you want to go <laughs> check yeah. it out. I actually signed up for the Kerbo app mm. and entered my Oh, yeah. I watched you. Intake. I saw that. And I entered her intake and I got the nice... And it was so um, gross because they responded by name to her. And seeing it say, Hannah... You should, you, do you know that you can save up your reds for a special occasion? The reds are foods like, you know, bread and butter um, and, you know, cheese and anything that has any calories in it. You can save those up for a special occasion. But seeing, seeing her name mm. as part of that made me so ill. Yeah. yeah. So ill. Like, like I could, having two girls myself, I could see, like, I I can't imagine them going through this. I can't imagine them having these feelings about their own bodies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you don't want to get me started on turbo any more than that. Cause I will keep going. But essentially when you have, I think girls and boys, it's especially, yeah. I think more difficult with girls just because <clears throat> I think body image issues are even more prevalent, but boys, you know, the incidence of, of eating disorders is increasing in boys as well. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry that my, I can't get my notifications to be silent. It's okay. Computer. Sorry about the dings. Um, but essentially, the best thing that you can do for your children, girls and boys, is to model um, a love for your body. And I know that you might not love your body, but try not to say disparaging things about your body or mm-hmm. about anyone else's body in front of your kids. Yeah. And that's hard for all of us. It's hard for me too, you know. And not at the saying part, but even just what we model, you know, I'll try something on with my kids in the dressing room and they'll be there with me. And it's so cute. They'll always be like, mommy, that looks beautiful on you. (laughs) And I'm I'm like, why don't I think about that, about everything I try on, you know, just what they're thinking. And sometimes I want to be, and I'll say, no, it's not for me. And they'll be like, why? And sometimes I want to be like, well, it makes my booty look big or it you know, it's really unflattering. And I'll just say, I'm just, I'm just not into it right now. Let's try something else on. I'll try to keep it neutral Mm -hmm. because I don't want them learning that like they need to obsess about every, every single inch on their body and every single reflection in the mirror. So, and it's so easy to tell your children that they're beautiful and to applaud their sense of confidence and all of their wonderful attributes, including their beauty inside and out. It's really hard to, to do it to yourself, but for kids, it's what we show them that matters more than what we tell them. Mm -hmm. And if we're not showing them that we can have a positive body image and love ourselves, how are they going to learn? It's a huge responsibility that like hits you right in the gut sometimes. Cause it's like, I didn't choose this. I don't want to be the one that has to show them this, but that's where most, you know, most, most adults learn their body image from their parents and even more often their mom, they're especially females. Um, and we have a big responsibility. It sucks. <laughs> yeah. But you, all you can do is be aware of it and try your best. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, get in the swimsuit and get in the pool with them, even <laughs> if you don't feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Your child's not sitting there going like, Ooh, stretch marks. Right. They don't care about that at all. Mm-hmm. And when you're, when they're older and they look back at their summers, I hope they remember, yeah, my mom got in the pool. Like she was playing with me. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be like, oh, this is what my mom looked like in a swimsuit. They don't, that doesn't even cross their mind. Mm -hmm. Very true. Very true. Um, Megan, thank you so much for coming on and answering all of these questions. Where can people find all of your amazing courses at and your Instagram and get in touch? Sure. So we're at feedinglittles.com. Um, we have a blog there with lots of information. We're still kind of organizing how we search it, but you can kind of scroll down and look at the different categories if you're lo- looking for a specific topic. Um, and then we're on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash feedinglittles. We're on Instagram at feedinglittles. We are on Pinterest. So pinterest.com slash feedinglittles. Um, and where else? We also have a Facebook group, like a free Facebook group. That's a larger Facebook group. And then if you 
purchase one of our courses, you become, you can um, join our private Feeding Littles clients only as well. So we have lots. If you just start searching Feeding Littles, you'll find us. Just everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so, so much for taking the time and coming on here again. You were so helpful and had so much information. And I look forward to chatting with you again. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Bye. I feel like when I have kids, I'm going to have to re-listen to this podcast because she gave us so much information and uh, I just emailed her and she agreed to give the listeners a code that will never expire. So you can use a code now if your baby loves weaning and for your toddler. The code is going to be Miraculous Mamas for $10 off either of the courses at Feeding Littles. Dot com. But she is just an awesome lady and I know she's in high demand and super busy. So I'm just very grateful that she took the time to come on here and connect with us and to answer your questions. Um, I mean, I, I'm i not a picky eater and Vito says he's not, but he's pickier than, than I think he likes to let on. He doesn't like quinoa. He doesn't like white fish. And I love both of those. So, um, but no, I think we all have different things that we can be picky about. If you guys aren't connected with the Patreon, definitely um, check it out. There's a bunch of amazing birth stories from our community on there. If you're not following us on Instagram, you're going to want to follow us. I put tons of information on there about the guests that are coming on and as well as tips. I'm always reposting things from Feeding Littles and others accounts just... Um, whether it be inspirational or educational. Um, Also join our Facebook group, Miraculous Mamas. There's an amazing community of women on there who are always helping each other out. And I'm just so grateful for them. They're just awesome, awesome women. Um, And you guys, this month is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. And so next week I'm going to be bringing on... um, a couple of people, uh, one who she is a childhood cancer survivor. She went through make a wish, had her wish came true. And now she's a pedi- pediatrician and a volunteer as a medical advisor for make a wish foundation. And she's just an awesome lady. And then I have another story to share with you guys, just to bring more awareness to childhood cancer and how so many people's lives are affected by it, not just the child, but, but everyone involved. So uh, I can't wait to share that with you, but I hope you everyone's having an amazing September and I can't wait to talk to you next week. If you ever have any questions or feedback, do not hesitate to reach out to me. You can DM me on Instagram uh, or you can find me on my website, elizabethjoy.co. You can always contact me through there, but I love you guys. Talk to you next week. podcast is brought to you by Wave Podcast Network. Check out all of our shows, including the Brain Candy Podcast, I Don't Get It, Coffee Convos, and Let's Talk About It.